Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Caught on body cam, police swarm a trash can where a shooting suspect is hiding. We'll take you through the harrowing moments for police. But first, day one of jury deliberations in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial now in the books. The jury concluded its deliberations about an hour ago, and we got some clues from the jurors, but not surprisingly, the nation's still waiting for a verdict. Rittenhouse, of course, accused of shooting three people too fatally in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after that Black Lives Matter protest. The defendant, who was armed with an AR-15, killed Joseph Rosenbaum outside a parking lot, and then just down the street, shot Anthony Huber and then Gage Grosskreutis, who would survive. Now, something very odd happened in the courtroom today. The defendant played a direct role in selecting which jurors will ultimately decide his fate. At the direction of Judge Schroeder, Rittenhouse selected, out of a raffle basket of 18 names, he selected the six jurors who will not be among those 12 deliberating. Those six will serve as alternates and be required to remain in the courthouse until the jury returns with a verdict in case a juror has to drop out. Now, this seems wacky to me. Apparently, the judge regularly does it. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. The jury today asked for extra copies of jury instructions, including pages that offer instructions on self-defense. The judge gave them 11 additional copies of pages one through six. Then later, they requested the rest of the instructions. If you tuned into the show last night, you heard me predict, and these predictions are always wrong, that a verdict, if there is one, might come on Thursday afternoon. And I've said that if there was a verdict today, there would have been great news, I think, for Kyle Rittenhouse. But this evening, the wait continues. No one's surprised. The reason this case could drag out, drag out is if the jury is either hung or disputing particular charges. I think there's no way, in my view, that he's likely to be convicted of the two top charges for the killing of Anthony Huber or the shooting of Gage Grosskreutis. Lesser included are a separate question. The question is really, though, about that first killing of Joseph Rosenbaum, where you're talking about first degree reckless homicide, not intentional. Now, obviously, there's a lot to unpack this evening. Joining us again is the former Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice, Janine Geske, who now teaches law at Marquette University. And Daniel Adams, an attorney at the Adams Law Group and a former assistant district attorney for Milwaukee County. Thank you both for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, um, Justice Geske, let me start with you. The jury asked for these jury instructions. Uh, they appear to be going through it methodically. We had no verdict today. Would you agree with me that if we heard, had heard the words verdict today, that that probably would have been very good news for Kyle Rittenhouse? Yes. Yes. I, I, it, what's happening is what I expected happening, that they're taking their time. And, and uh, the longer it goes, I think the better it is for the prosecution. <laughs> yeah. And, and Daniel Adams, th they now have those jury instructions back there. You've tried a lot of these cases. Give us some insight into what jurors typically do in a big case like this. Now, obviously, you can't mind read and you can't see through walls. So I know that you're not going to be able to tell us exactly what they're doing, but you certainly can tell us what you know jurors typically do in a case like this when they get the jury instructions, et cetera. Sure. Well, I think uh, Justice Geske is right. Uh, had there been early news, we would have known that they had a knee-jerk reaction against the government's case, and that didn't happen. They're in the getting-to-know-you phase uh, of this committee hearing, which is really what a jury deliberation is. It's a committee of people who have never met together before. And so I thought it was really interesting. Usually in Wisconsin, they get a binder, a single binder uh, with the jury instructions, and it's sent back and they'll elect a foreman. The foreman will go through those. And if somebody wants to uh, take a look, they'll just pass it down. The fact that the jury each wanted their own set of instructions means that they are really paying attention uh, to the law given to them by the judge. Um, I want to go through this thing about the, the defendant picking out in a, in a raffle-like style the jurors who are not going to preside um, in the case, or at least going to be alternates for now. The judge literally at the end of the day today, it, was, it happened like an hour ago, knowing that people like me are going to be saying, what is this judge doing here? Tried to explain himself. This is number 23. Let's listen to the judge. 
The media, somebody asked from the media, and I have no idea who, inquired about the method of selection of those to be struck from the jury just now, this, this afternoon, this morning, whatever, this morning. Um, that's been the practice in this court for, I'm going to say, 20 years at least that I've been doing that. All right. I'm at his word that he's been doing it for 20 years. But it seems to me, Justice Gasky, like he's been doing some wacky stuff for 20 years. I mean, isn't it odd to have the yeah. defendant reaching into a bowl to pick the numbers of the people who are going to be the alternate jurors deciding his fate? This is the judge who walks to the beat of his own drummer. He's got <laughs> these rules and they're quirky. Um, I've never seen anybody do that. Um, I, I mean, I... It was pretty shocking, and and he doesn't still explain why he does it, except that he's done it for twenty years. So, um, yes, well, you know, and I guess, yeah, and I guess look, the argument Daniel could be that by allowing the defendant to do it, the defendant can't argue later that there was somehow an unfair process involved in doing it. But it seems like a bit of a spectacle. Oh, it's a total spectacle, but God love him. I kind of like it. There's always this <laughs> awkward moment at the end of the trial where, you know, they put little slips of paper into a hat or maybe there is a little, um, you know, bin that, that usually the clerk or the judge themselves uh, pick into and blindly pick out who the alternate would be. And I've had clients who say, well, what's that about? Do, do you think that all the numbers were actually in there? And at least at, at, with this method, Kyle Rittenhouse knows that he was somewhat the master of his own fate when it came to picking uh, those alternates. Uh, I, I will tell you that, and I'm not going to name him because I'm not interested in shaming him right now, but I heard a CNN anchor ask one of the dumbest questions I've ever heard in connection with a case like this. And the question was, based on the balance of women versus men who are on the jury, how do you think that the verdict is going to come out? And it was one of these questions for lawyers, which is just like, and, and good for the lawyer who was on CNN who said, it really tells me, it tells me nothing um, about the case. But, but as we were talking about this, I just thought about the fact that, that you know, there are important questions and they're not. One important question is the law. We just talked about the fact that the jurors have asked for those jury instructions. I think that the single most important legal issue in this case is count one. This is number four in our, our, our list here. This is first degree reckless homicide. Now, it is important to note, reckless homicide is, in is different from intentional homicide. This is the shooting of the first guy, Joseph Rosenbaum. Prosecutors not charging intentional homicide. It says that the defendant recklessly caused the death of Joseph Rosenbaum under circumstances which show disregard for human life, contrary to various sections in the statute. Um, you know, Judge Geske, why do you think in this case they went for reckless homicide on that one and intentional homicide on the other two cases? Or in intentional att attempted with one of the other two? Right. I think that, that you know, the beginning, the, the, with Mr. Rosenbaum, it's a little more confusing with Rosenbaum approaching um, the defendant, and the defendant hasn't pulled out the gun yet. And I think that they thought that that was a safer charge. I think it's a smarter charge than, than um, intentional um, first-degree homicide. On the other one, I think there's a real issue that those individuals were trying to stop him after he had committed a homicide and that he went and shot them in response to them trying to stop. And they considered that much more intentional um, than the first act. But I have to say, uh, Daniel Adams, do you disagree with my analysis? I think that's I think everything is going to depend on that one reckless homicide charge with Rosenbaum. I've got to believe that based on all the evidence that was presented, if the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt to disprove self-defense, that one guy who comes at him with a skateboard, another guy who points a gun at him, that in those two cases, that there almost, you know, I shouldn't say there almost has to be. It is very likely that there would be a not guilty verdict on those. Well, yeah, in a, in a different universe with a different prosecutor, they may have just charged uh, the Rosenbaum uh, homicide and, and, and not charged the second two, recognizing that they were much tougher charges to prove given uh, the, the other one man had a skateboard, the other had a pistol. Uh, certainly uh, uphill 
and sledding for the state on yep. those two charges. There's another, uh, you know, alternative. He could have charged second degree intentional homicide on that first shooting, which would have taken off the question of whether or not uh, uh, Rittenhouse had his own subjective belief that he was acting reasonably and focused the jury on the objective reasonableness of his action. Well, and for those of you wondering why we're going so in the weeds here, the reason is because this is what the jury's doing. There's a reason they asked for those jury instructions. It was so they could review the law. That is what is going to determine the outcome in this case. So, you know, I, I beg your forgiveness on the fact that we're going to get a little weedy on some of this. And I want to talk, this is number five. This is one of the least discussed charges in this case. First degree recklessly endangering safety. And it basically goes to the fact that the defendant endangered the safety of Richard McGinnis, who was um, a reporter who was there. And the third count says that the defendant recklessly endangered the safety of another person there, basically when he fired his weapon. Now, those are charges which would really be lesser convictions. But uh, Justice Geske, in terms of um, laying out for us more likely, less likely conviction, where do you think that those reckless endangering safety charges fall? I think because they are not the primary focus of the case um, and the arguments, I think that those will be sort of the, the side issues that the jury will worry about. They're going to look at Rosenbaum particularly. Um, I, think that, I think the secondary shooting is important because, you know, I, people are going to say to themselves, let's say you have an active shooter, and I don't think he qualifies as an active shooter, but you have an active shooter and two people approach him trying to get the gun away or get him to stop and they wind up being killed is there a self-defense claim there and so i think the jury's going to be looking at from all those angles but i think those three victims who were shot two of whom died are really going to be the focus of the jury and i'm happy they're looking at the jury instructions that is their role and right. and they're heading in a good direction all right i'm gonna ask you both to stick around for a minute because i want to ask you after this break about this moment in the courtroom yesterday where the prosecutor, Thomas Binger, pointed the AR-15 in the courtroom. And there's been a lot of talk about that. Can we show the picture? Um, there's been a lot of talk about that since it happened. We're going to take a break. We will show the picture after the break. Coming right back with our guests. The defendant comes running in and drops the fire extinguisher on the ground like this. and then raises his left hand to the gun and points. This is what we see in the video. Him putting the fire extinguisher on the ground and then raising the gun. And you see there the photographer taking a photo of it. We'll show it to you from the other end. The jury has just concluded day one of deliberations in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Still with us is former Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice Janine Geske. Uh, and Daniel Adams, former assistant district attorney in Milwaukee. Uh, Daniel Adams, uh, you had a lot of people in the Twitterverse and elsewhere commenting about the DA pointing the weapon, it seems, uh, towards the jury, making comparisons to Alec Baldwin uh, and others. Was that improper for the prosecutor to do? No. Listen, the jury has been watching all of this unfold. We've talked about how there's really few facts to find in this case because they've seen each of the three shootings from every vantage point, it seems. Uh, but it seems a little, um, you know, um, antiseptic. And they needed to see, from the state's point of view, they needed to get in the real world. And having that big, scary gun, and for lots of us, these ARs are big, scary guns, uh, pointed in their direction, that really probably uh, drove home uh, the seriousness and realness of this situation. I want to play, a, this is number 13, I want to play a piece of sound from the closing argument yesterday. This is the prosecutor um, talking about, again, Joseph Rosenbaum. It's a name that if you're going to follow this case, you have to know because he was the person who was first shot. He's the one who was shot four times. He's the one where I think that if there is dissension in that jury, it's going to be over that particular charge. I think that th this entire case rests on whether the jurors believe that in that case, it was a valid claim of self-defense. 
This is how the prosecutor tried to rebut some of the defense argument, number 13. That's why the defense is trying so desperately hard to convince you that Joseph Rosenbaum threatened to kill the defendant, which never happened. That's why they're trying so desperately hard to convince you that Joseph Rosenbaum was reaching for that gun. Because if he's not reaching for that gun and he's not going to use it to kill the defendant, it is not justified. There is no valid self-defense claim. All right. Now, Justice Gasky, I mean, he's saying that it didn't happen, but there was another witness in addition to Kyle Rittenhouse who said that Rosenbaum made that threat. I, that's true. I still think that the jury is going to just evaluate, you know, Rittenhouse from his viewpoint, whether he reasonably believed that, that Rosenbaum was going to take that gun and shoot him. Um, and I, I think I think that's that's the case that the state has the strongest evidence on. And it's not going to surprise me if the jury convicts him of that one. Although and I want to play this is um, number 20. This is what I thought was one of the single most important points in the entire trial that is not really being discussed. Because if you agree with me that this Rosenbaum thing, it's all about this. This is the medical examiner being questioned by the defense attorney about Rosenbaum and about some of the physical evidence and what they found. Let's listen. There is no soot stippling here, correct? Uh, I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. The bulk of it starts between what would be the ring and commonly kind of referred to as middle finger? Yes. Okay, so that means the barrel of the gun, if not touching, would have been like this. It's in that location, that's okay. correct. So that hand was over the barrel of Mr. Rittenhouse's gun when his hand was shot. That makes sense. That's the prosecution's witness, Daniel Adams. That was powerful. Oh, it sure was. Uh, you know, juries love the medical examiner. Uh, they're, they're kind of Joe Friday, just the facts type uh, witnesses. And the defense was able to spin it around on him. Uh, Listen, the, the big thing about Rosenbaum, who seemed like chaos personified, if you listen to some of the witnesses, uh, was how close he was to Rittenhouse when that first gunshot went off. Now, the state is saying that he uh, was falling towards Rittenhouse uh, when, when, when uh, that shot came through his hand uh, because he had been shot before. Uh, that's a major point in contention here, uh, and it goes to how reasonable Rittenhouse was acting. We shall see. Day one is concluded. My guess is we're going to be here day two doing more tea leaf reading, but we shall see. Former Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice Janine Gasky, thank you so much. Um, and uh, criminal defense attorney Daniel Adams, appreciate your time. Thank you. Now, coming up as the media obsesses over the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, more legal analysts seem to be giving up analysis and just serving as legal advocates particularly some in the left-leaning media who just want to see him convicted. That's coming up. With a case as explosive as the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, it is hardly surprising to hear the talking heads on cable news, their partisan hot takes designed to appeal to their partisan audiences. All right. But when a news broadcast purports to offer legal analysis from actual attorneys, which is really just blatant advocacy, I get concerned, even upset. Now, this is a topic near and dear to my heart because I'm regularly on ABC News spouting off with my legal assessments on analysis of stories. And I get things wrong sometimes. I hope not too often. But I try to base it on the evidence, on the facts, not on preconceived notions of what an audience wants to see or hear. Last night on Joy Reid's MSNBC program, the host invited two attorneys on to discuss the Kyle Rittenhouse case, and their rhetoric was completely indistinguishable from the host. They delivered largely political punditry disguised as legal expertise. And to be clear, these are two accomplished lawyers. Listen to this commentary from Katie Fang, a trial lawyer and MSNBC legal contributor, responding to an assertion from Reid that the Rittenhouse defense was looking to appeal to Fox News viewers on the jury. Fang happily accepted that premise. 
what they did on the defense is they basically wanted to inflame the jury to think that it was totally fine for Kyle Rittenhouse to come in on his white horse, this night on the white horse, to save that community of Kenosha, which he had no business being there in the first place. The thing that we heard in the rebuttal close, I think that really made sense and that would counter what the defense was attempting to do today was the fact that they called Rittenhouse a chaos tourist. Kind of reminded you a little bit about the January 6th insurrection, right? This idea that you had people that showed up armed to do harm. And that is exactly what Kyle Rittenhouse did as a chaos tourist. He showed up. He didn't mean to improve the community. And you know what? If the jury listens to the law and applies the facts and the evidence to the law, then they should be able to come back with at least one conviction. Now, I understand she wants a conviction. But is that what passes for objective legal analysis these days? I expect that from Joy Reid, but not from the legal analysts. Moments later, fellow panelist and former federal prosecutor Paul Butler one-upped Fang with this scorching take. The through line between the Rittenhouse case and the Georgia case of Ahmaud Arbery's killers is guns. How many Americans are walking around strapped down with firearms, trying to act yeah. like cops, paying more attention to yeah. black people? trying to guard people's property or police protest marches. And these people knowingly put themselves in harm's way. And when they do that, they then say they feel threatened and they use their guns to kill. And the concern, Joy, is that if the defendants are allowed to get away with this, we should expect to see more cases of armed vigilantism just like this. That is political advocacy, period. This case is nothing like the trial of the men accused of murdering Ahmad Arbery. It's not legal analysis either. This is a lawyer suggesting the outcome should be dictated not by what evidence the jurors heard in the courtroom, but calling for Rittenhouse effectively to be convicted for political and societal reasons. Why should future events have any impact on the outcome of this case? One thing we should be grateful for is that there's a camera in the courtroom. So you can decide for yourself what you make of the testimony. Rather than having to rely on analysts to, with clear agendas. Now, knowing that neither Fang nor Butler could appear here because they are MSNBC legal analysts, we welcome Aiden McLaughlin. He's the editor-in-chief of Mediate.com, a site that I founded. Aiden, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, am I being too school marmy here in thinking, oh, the legal analysts are going to be different than the typical pundits and saying, oh, I'm shocked that the legal analysts are being really partisan? No, not at all. I think that's the reasonable expectation that when you turn on a news network, even if you're watching an opinion show on cable news, that the legal analysts are there to assess what the law is and to give you a clear eyed view of that. Um, I think this Rittenhouse case is another disappointing example. We've had a lot of recent ones lately um, of nuance in a really tricky case being bulldozed in favor of this binary good versus evil coverage uh, that feeds into the never ending culture war. And I think Cable news outlets like CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News are really the primary uh, culprits in this regard. Um, you know, pundits on MSNBC, uh, like these legal analysts that you saw, they're, they're good examples of the facts of a case being ignored in favor of partisan red meat being served up. And I think the reason for that is just the incentives there are you get more ratings if you have more opinion. So not only do you have hosts getting more opinionated on these networks, you now have the legal analysts that are also falling into that trap. And I want to play, to be clear, it's not just MSNBC. I want to play this commentary from Fox News legal analyst uh, Greg Jarrett on Friday. In particular, listen to the end of his commentary. I think he has mounted with his defense attorneys a very strong case. And they had an advantage going into this. Uh, you know, th this has been an unmitigated disaster for prosecutors mm. as their witnesses and their evidence, Brian, have disintegrated. Why did they charge? Right. I think the right. obvious answer is that, that they fell victim to public pressure, the woke mob and the media that drove a false narrative. So you see what they do there, right? And, and we saw this from the MSNBC analysts too. They throw in some actual analysis. I agree with Greg that the case is not going mm. well at all for the prosecution. And then they inject the red meat, right? The stuff that isn't legal analysis, which is just intended to appeal to these very partisan audiences. And it is just, it, it is maddening for me. 
Yeah, and you know, it's interesting that you bring up Greg Jarrett there because um, I actually reported in 2019 that Greg Jarrett, after 15 years at Fox News serving as an anchor, was stripped of the title and made a legal analyst because his coverage, his opinion coverage, one executive at the time told me, went off the deep end. Um, so what's funny here is that you have someone who was considered an anchor at Fox News for 15 years and then was made a legal analyst because his <laughs> coverage was considered so wacky and conspiratorial um, that to allow him to go on Hannity every night and, and say the stuff that he does, they made him a legal analyst, which is sort of baffling as, as like a, a, a way for a news network to, to run. And incredibly insulting to us legal analysts, if that was actually I'm the sorry. reason. Greg, <laughs> sorry about by, that. By the, way, by the way, Greg's an old friend. I mean, I've known Greg since back in the days of court TV. I mean, he didn't used to sort of do this kind of stuff. But uh, look, this is not a personal attack on any of the people involved here. This is just a statement, an overview of what a disaster I think cable news has become for many people, in particular when you're looking for legal analysis and instead what you end up getting is partisan red meat. Aiden McLaughlin from Mediate.com, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. All right, the nation's been captivated by the Rittenhouse trial, but there's been a sidebar. The odd antics of the judge, not his rulings or his battle with the lawyers, just his quirks from Jeopardy to phone rings to cookbooks. It's in tonight's Mediate Moments coming up. Time for our Mediate Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. The trial of Kyle Rittenhouse captivated the uh, nation over the question of self-defense versus vigilante justice. And while the wall-to-wall -wall coverage has ended as the jury just concluded its first day of deliberations, there's one breakout and controversial star from the whole ordeal. Judge Bruce Schroeder. You are already, you were, I, I was a, astonished when you began your examination by commenting on the defendant's post-arrest silence. That's basic law. It's been basic law in this country for 40 years, 50 years. The Don't get mine. brazen with me. Yes, Judge Schroeder got himself a lot of attention with a fit of yelling at the prosecutor. And depending on where you stand on the trial, you either see him as a hero or a villain or maybe something else. But for purposes of this segment, he's just a really entertaining guy. Take, for example, how he passed the time during jury selection. Yes, we do play Jeopardy here when we've got some downtime. Truffle syrup, cassava melon, and uh, a Playboy model, Marley Renfro, were enlisted to create an iconic scene in this film. That would be What is Psycho? <laughs> yes, that's Judge Schroeder playing game of Jeopardy with potential jurors. Another way to pass the time? Reading what appears to be a cookie catalog called Cookie Book which he apparently paged through for 10 minutes during a recess. So he likes Jeopardy and cookies, you know, who doesn't? As for his music, well, that became clear from his phone ring. And if the court makes a finding that uh, the actions that I had talked about were done in bad faith. Judge Schroeder's ringtone went off with none other than Lee Greenwood's patriotic anthem, God Bless the USA. He also opined on the supply chain issues as it applies to his lunch. Uh, let's hope for one o'clock. I don't know. The, uh, hope the Asian food isn't coming. It's on, isn't on one of those boats in Long, uh, Long Beach Harbor. Uh, now, of course, the PC police saw that as an opportunity for a citation. The Washington Post headline read, Judge and Kyle Rittenhouse trial faces backlash from Asian food joke. Definitely not okay. All I know is that this Jeopardy-loving, Lee Greenwood listening and supply chain joking making judge made for some entertaining fodder, despite the very dark subject matter during this case. And perhaps we can look forward to seeing him host his own daytime court show in the near future? That is our wrap of the day's media bias, buzz, and bull. Up next, the Wyoming GOP has spoken. Liz Cheney, not a Republican as far as they're concerned anymore. Who cares that she's got one of the most conservative voting records in Congress? We talked to a Wyoming GOP legislator about this bizarre development. Wyoming's state Republican Party has made it official. Following Donald Trump appears to be more important than being a real conservative. They have voted to no longer recognize Congresswoman Liz Cheney as a member of the party. Her second rebuke in less than a year. 
The resolution, which is effectively a legislative temper tantrum, passed the Wyoming GOP Central Committee by a narrow vote of 31 to 29. Now, despite what you may hear from some, Cheney is actually one of the most conservative lawmakers in Congress today. That is not me judging. Conservative advocacy group Heritage Action scores each member of Congress by how conservative they are, measuring how members vote and what bills they sponsor. They've given Cheney a 96% for the current congressional session. The average House Republican scores a 93%. Now, while Trump was in office, Cheney supported the 2017 Tax Cuts and Job Act, arguably considered the most significant piece of legislation passed during the Trump presidency. She voted for the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement, Trump's replacement for NAFTA. She backed a federal ban on abortion after 20 weeks of pregnancy, as well as a bill making concealed carry firearm permits valid across state lines. In 2018, she voted against impeaching Donald Trump. In fact, according to 538, Cheney voted with Trump nearly 93% of the time while he was in office. Meanwhile, Elise Stefanik, who replaced Cheney in House Republican leadership, voted with Trump less than 78% of the time. And it's not like Cheney suddenly begun supporting the Biden agenda. According to 538, Cheney votes with Biden 12% of the time. She voted against the infrastructure package, against the Democrats' efforts on voting rights, against raising the debt ceiling, against Biden's $3.5 trillion budget, against granting DC statehood, and strengthening the EPA. Cheney even voted against a waiver allowing Lloyd Austin to become Secretary of Defense, despite voting to grant the same waiver to Trump's first defense secretary, General James Mattis, in 2017. Now, without judging whether she's right or wrong about any of that, the Wyoming GOP seems to want to ignore all of it because she dared vote to impeach the former president after the Capitol riot and continues to criticize Trump's lies about the 2020 election. Now, Wyoming's GOP had already censured Cheney over her criticism of Trump after the January 6th event. She is already facing a primary involving at least four challengers, including one already endorsed by the former president. This is all because of Cheney's refusal to cave to Trump. Now, let me be clear. Maybe the people of Wyoming don't want Liz Cheney anymore. Fair enough. That is what elections are for, and that is up to them. If you're in Wyoming, to you. But in the meantime, what is this vote? We reached out to the Republican Party of Wyoming and members of the Wyoming GOP who voted to rebuke Cheney. We either got silence or responses like this from Carbon County Republican Party Chair Joey Carrenti IV. I'm sorry, but I do not sign up to be the fodder for liberal media hacks. Mr. Abrams will have to find his patsy somewhere else. So for highlighting the absurdity of the GOP sanctioning someone with a nearly perfect conservative record, that makes me a liberal media hack. Got it. Joining us now to discuss is Dr. Joe McGinley, state committeeman and former chair of the Natrona County Wyoming Republican Party. Thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it. So, you know, have your, have your colleagues gone mad here? I mean, I, I would just think that the number one issue for the GOP for your colleagues would be, does the person vote conservative or not? It seems though that they are focused more on total, total fealty to Donald Trump. Yeah, Dan, I, I mean, you really did summarize it well. Uh, you don't get more conservative than Representative Cheney. You just don't. Uh, she has this pesty thing called a voting record. And really that, that's been disturbing to the uh, leadership in the Wyoming Republican Party. That vote this past weekend, uh, that was just showmanship. It's completely irrelevant. Uh, the party is losing relevance uh, here in the state, the leadership in the party. And, and votes like this are why. They're, they're really pushing away the true conservatives, the true Republican voters, who don't want them to speak on their behalf. But as you mentioned, uh, the people of Wyoming will vote, and we'll vote in our primary in August. And that's when this decision will be made. Um, do you have any sense? I mean, I know there are a lot of people who are very angry at her. Any sense, though, of what her chances are? Yeah, again, Representative Cheney has an excellent chance here in Wyoming. Are, are individuals angry? Yes. I mean, you saw that email you received. Uh, you know, I want to apologize on behalf of the Republican Party for that, uh, that <laughs> message. But, uh, you know, th there's voters on both sides of this issue. Uh, it's one of those things, really. This came up at, at a time where there was strong emotion. Uh, people were disappointed in the national election. Uh, in Wyoming, we had the highest voting percentage for President Trump. When President Trump lost that election, 
people were really disappointed. It, it was really going to affect our economy. It was going to affect uh, our livelihoods uh, here in this state. Uh, then the issue of the impeachment vote came up, and, and it sort of piled on on that emotion. What we're seeing now, however, and that vote reflected it, it was 31-29. That's fairly close. Um, what we're seeing now are people are getting back to logic. They're saying, who really does represent Wyoming? Who is the best for what our state needs? Uh, we're concerned about our natural resources. Uh, we're concerned about jobs. We're concerned about taxes. We're concerned about government overreach. These are the topics that need to be discussed. As Republicans, we really believe in our conservative values. Uh, we should not be arguing about people. We should be arguing about principles. And we should be arguing about uh, areas that we can actually affect and change. Well, let me let me ask you this. Is the party going to try to prevent her from running as a Republican, even if she wins the primary? Uh, you know, Dan, at this point, I guess everything's on the table. Uh, you know, I was at the meeting when Representative Cheney was censured a few months ago. I was shocked by that action. Uh, the voters uh, selected and, and elected Representative Cheney. She was our representative. Uh, you want to, for whether you agree or disagree, you want to support your representative. You want them to be successful for your state for your community. So trying to undermine them or undermine their ability to do the work of your state just doesn't make sense. Uh, this vote this past weekend, again, I was absolutely shocked that this came up again. I thought the topic was settled. Uh, the state party shook their fist at Representative Cheney. They made their point. They got their attention. And I thought we had moved on. Uh, however, that wasn't the case. Um, and you know that, that gets back to the leadership, the extremist behavior. Uh, it's becoming irrelevant at this point. Uh, and the only way that you can get back to it is just keep going back to the same well and seeing if you get lucky again. Unfortunately, this I, time with the 31 to 29 vote, we're starting to see fatigue on this matter. Even individuals that don't agree with Representative Cheney, uh, they're starting to get tired of the argument. They're starting to get tired of the of the topic of discussion. Because again, if you get back to the to the facts, and the facts are the voting record, Representative Cheney is as yeah. conservative as it comes. I don't get this is this is bananas uh, to me, uh, but we shall see. Joseph McGinley, appreciate you coming on the show. Please send your colleague who wrote me that lovely note. A big hello from us. All right. Thank you, Dan. Have a good evening. Coming up. We're gonna send a dog. He's going to find you. He's going to bite you. Even the threat of a police dog not stopping a shooting suspect from coming out of a trash can he's hiding in. The whole thing is on body cam. Sean Sticks Larkin joins us live to talk about it next. Time for our police cam segment showing the dangers officers face on a daily basis. This starts with a 911 call as a suspect fires shots at a construction site in Bakersfield, California. I'm a security guard out here. Hey. The guy just fired a gun at us. Okay, where are you at? Okay, and what kind of vehicle is it? It was a green Chevy with a camper shell. It was the second time the suspect, Shea Zaniga Jr., opened fire in the area. Fortunately, no one was injured in either of the incidents. Zaniga then went to a family member's home. Now, as officers were discussing how to approach the house, Zaniga drove by. You can see it there. Officers chased him. And Zaniga then crashed less than a minute later. He then got out and shot at officers, hitting their car at least four times. Zaniga then jumped over the same wall he hit with the truck. Officers started searching the neighborhood, having to also worry about the safety of people in homes. Now, we have a primary concern right now being the residents inside. If this suspect forces entry into a residence, we have a hostage situation. We cannot allow that. Yes, sir. We can do that, but we need to make sure that we take no. action onto this suspect, right? Because he can just easily get over a fence and into somebody else's residence. So my concern is now we're going to have long guns being able to make contact. We have a block wall directly behind where officers are at. So if we do engage in gunfire, keep your gunfire under block wall level. Understood? Yes, sir. Sergeant told officers that even though they'd found one gun belonged to the suspect, he could still be armed. Police called for Zaniga to give himself up. Bakersfield Police Department, Police K-9. We know you are in one of these yards. Come out with your hands up. Surrender peacefully or we'll send a dog. He will find you. He will bite I you. Hope. Police found Zaniga hiding in a trash can. <laughs> The 
Zuniga was pronounced dead. His gun was found in a nearby backyard. It had been fired until it was empty. Investigators also found other weapons the suspect threw away near his relative's home. No, none of the officers were injured. Joining me now, Sean Sticks Larkin, retired Tulsa police lieutenant. Um, Sticks, this is all sort of a worst case scenario for officers based on the time of day, the fact that this is a dangerous suspect, and that you've got this in a residential neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. It is. It's uh, middle of the night. You know, you have an armed individual that's out running around that's basically committed three different crimes. Uh, you know, a disturbance where shots are fired, he fires at a security guard. And the first thing I actually thought about was, did he think this was a police officer? Is that why he fired at him? Uh, then shows up at a family member's house. As you mentioned, they called in that he had a gun there. Uh, police are trying to find out a way to take him into custody safely. Unfortunately, it didn't end that way. You have the pursuit with additional shots fired. But something I want to point out here, you can hear the supervisor out there at the scene uh, somebody who has been through these type of scenarios, who's an experienced officer, probably working with a lot of very young officers on an overnight shift or a graveyard shift. And he's basically explaining to these guys, hey, here are our rules of engagement. You know, he's wanting these guys to think about policy. He's wanting to think about case law, uh, tactical operation guidelines, all these type of things to give these young officer, excuse me, give these young officers confidence in what they're doing out there that night. Six, I've got 30 seconds left. Uh, the officers had to make a split-second decision when, he's, when they're outside the trash can there. Talk to me about that. Yeah, it is. You know, it's basically going to come down what, was, uh, what would a reasonable officer believe at that very moment. The suspect pops out of the trash can very quickly. You hear an officer say he's got something in his hands. Is a suspect making a gesture as if he has a weapon and the officer perceives that as a threat? And that's what needs to be uh, looked at and evaluated in this investigation. And they did uh, find, as we pointed out, that weapon uh, there, which uh, had been uh, fired uh, numerous times. Sean Larkin, as always, yes, thank you very much for coming on. Appreciate it. Anytime, Dan. That does it for us tonight. We are continuing to wait for that verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse case. You know we're going to be all over it. Whether there is a verdict or there isn't a verdict, News Nation Prime starts right now. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.